coming. I really appreciate such a great turnout tonight. That's really nice to see you all here. Um, and I look forward to, to talking to you about anxiety in adolescence and answering any of your questions at the end. So, um, great. So let's start off just with a case. Uh, so this is an example of an adolescent who is anxious. This is Laura. And she says, I'm always worrying about stuff. My friends have always called me a worry wart. I think if something can go wrong, it will. Are my family okay? Are my, why are my friends late? Don't they like me anymore? Is my homework correct? I only checked it three times. I think about the bad things that have happened in the past as well as the ones that will happen in the future. Sometimes my worries stop me to, uh, from getting to sleep for hours and it seems I've always been this way but worrying takes so much time and energy I even worry that I worry too much. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Anyone recognise any of this, these thoughts perhaps in their family or friends? Um, this is something that we see a lot in our clinic. So another case, this is Mark. And Mark says, people keep saying that I'm really shy. I guess I don't mix much with other people. I don't go to parties because I don't feel like I fit in. I really want to ask this girl out, and I've been trying for ages to psych myself up to it, but I just can't. I keep thinking, what a loser I am. There's no way she'll say yes. Who'd want to go out with someone like me? I can't even go into a shop and ask something, ask for something without stuttering and twitching. They must think I'm so lame. Okay, so here we have a couple of examples of uh, adolescents who are anxious about different kinds of things. One's a typical um, warrior, worrying about lots of different things. Um, another person more focused on social interaction and feeling really shy. So what is anxiety overall? Well, anxiety refers to a feeling of fear or apprehension or worry. And it's important to acknowledge that everybody experiences anxiety from time to time. And anxiety is actually a really useful emotion because it helps us to, to deal with threat. So I don't know if you know anyone who has a very low level of anxiety. Someone perhaps who takes uh, risks that you wouldn't want, want them to take, who perhaps does some um, pretty silly things. Um, and when we think about life without anxiety would actually be pretty dangerous if we weren't thinking about um, some of the potential threats <coughs> that are in our environment and around <coughs> us. Um, but of course, it can be the other end of the extreme as well, and it can be, we can become too anxious, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so when we think about anxiety, I generally tend to think about it in just three different components the physical sensations, so what actually goes on in our body when we feel anxious, what we feel in our body, um, the thoughts or perceptions that we have when we're anxious, so what goes through our mind when we're feeling fearful or worried, and also the behaviours, the actions that we do when we feel anxious. So what are the physical sensations? The physical sensations of anxiety can be very uncomfortable, very unpleasant, and they're often the reason that people present to treatment. They say, I feel awful. Um, my, heart race, my heart races, I feel sweaty, I feel really tense, I get perhaps headaches or backaches, um, tension in the shoulders, um, my breathing rate is increased, so they might be breathing really quickly, having a dry mouth feeling um, butterflies in the tummy or feeling a bit nauseous, feeling sick, um, trembling, shaking, dizzy. So pretty unpleasant experiences. Um, but actually these experiences that happen in our body, these different physical sensations, are actually there for a reason and they're part of the fight or flight response. So the fight or flight response is an inbuilt survival mechanism that human beings and animals too have in their bodies to help them deal with uh, threat. So what happens is that your body when you're threatened undergoes a series of changes to help you either fight that threat off or to run away. So when your heart is pumping really quickly it's actually doing a good thing, it's pumping lots of blood to your muscles to help you either fight or flee. When you sweat, it's cooling you down. 
when your muscles tense, they're getting you ready for action, that fight or flight. And when you start to breathe faster, you're trying to get more oxygen to those muscles to help you. Um, and of course, when we breathe too quickly, we actually can start to hyperventilate a little bit is what, what it's called. And that can lead to some of the other symptoms of anxiety like nausea, dry mouth and dizziness. But the main point is that the fight or flight response in itself is not a problem. It's a good thing to have it. We wouldn't want to not have that. So if you can imagine you walk into a dark alley um, and you're on your own and then someone steps out looking very menacing with a baseball bat. You would want to have a physical reaction there. That is a good thing that your heart starts pounding, that your, that your muscles start tensing because you need to be ready to either fight that person off or to run away. Um, it's only really a problem, this fight or flight response, when it's switched on when we don't want it to be, or when the intensity of the response seems out of proportion to the actual danger. So the example I g just gave, there's clearly a real threat there. Um, but the thing is that the fight or flight response is a response to um, it's designed to help us cope with physical danger, but it actually occurs whenever we feel under threat, even if the danger isn't physical. So an example would be me talking to you here tonight. My heart's racing a little bit. My hands feel a little bit clammy. It's not because I think any of you are going to come and beat me up. It's not because I'm in physical danger. The danger here is, I guess, a social danger, really. It's a danger that people won't like my talk or that they think that I'm silly or something like that. Um, people experience anxiety in a range of situations like this, public speaking, meeting new people, um, you know, a whole range of situations which I'll go into. Um, but usually it's because the person anticipates that something bad could happen and it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical danger. Um, we still get the fight or flight response. <coughs> Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the physical sensations. So what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about the thoughts or perceptions that um, tend to occur with anxiety, particularly in adolescence. So what are the threats in adolescence? When, we're an, uh, when we are an adolescent, we're, we're um, growing up, we're in that awkward and difficult transition period between being a child and being an adult. What are the things that can go wrong? What are the threats around us? first one that springs to mind, which is particularly salient in adolescence of it, um, very often, is social rejection. So the worry that other people won't like me, that I won't fit in, that other people will think I'm ugly or fat or boring or a loser or, you know, the, the list could go on. Um, and in fact, adolescence is a time where friendships are very important, when fitting in seems extremely important. And so the threat of having that go wrong in some way can be extremely anxiety provoking. Uh, another kind of threat that, that um, people worry about in, in teenage years and in adulthood as well is poor achievement. So the worry that I won't perform well, whether it be in academics or sports or music, um, I won't meet my standards or I, might, I won't meet the standards of other people like my parents or my friends or my teachers or I'll fail. These, these can be very threatening ideas, uh, very scary ideas for a teen. <coughs> um, parental reactions, um, my parents will be disappointed or they'll be angry or they'll be upset with me can seem quite threatening. Um, some teenagers worry <coughs> also about the physical threat, the <coughs> illness, they worry that they'll get sick, they worry that they'll be assaulted or kidnapped or actually um, come into some kind of physical harm. And other teenagers worry not so much about themselves and their own physical safety, but about the physical safety of their loved ones. So something will happen to my mum or to my dad or to my siblings or friends. Um, someone I love will get sick or die or be harmed. So these are all perceptions of threats that we have in adolescence. These are just examples. Of course, there are more, but these are some of the common ones that we see. And it's important to remember here that it is the perception that counts, okay? So sometimes anxious expectations or thoughts can seem a bit irrational. So I might be looking at my, at my friend or, or my daughter or my son and thinking, you 
you're worried that you're going to fail this test, but you always get great marks. This just doesn't make sense to me. Why are you worrying about this? This is so silly. Um, and so it can be extremely frustrating when it doesn't actually fit with the facts. Um, it can be frustrating for parents and siblings and friends. But it's important to remember that if a person expects something bad to happen, they will feel anxious, even if that expectation seems unreasonable to other people. So let's say I were to see, let's say that I were to see a snake down there, and you guys know, all know, that it's a toy snake. But I don't know that. I don't know it's a toy snake. I'm going to be just as frightened of it as if it, if it's, if whether it's real or it's fake, it doesn't matter. It's how I perceive it that's actually important in relation to anxiety. And, and, and this is the case with, certainly in adolescence, but all anxiety problems. Um, okay, behaviours. So what are, what's another component of anxiety is our actions. It affects the way that we act. <coughs> so as I mentioned, anxiety can feel pretty horrible. Um, it's not pleasant to feel your heart racing, your stomach churning, to be sweating, to be thinking about all these possible catastrophes that could occur. It's not a nice experience. And so very naturally, people who feel anxiety a lot try to avoid the situations that make them feel anxious. Um, and so these, that's perfectly natural and normal to want to, to avoid those. And so this avoidance can be of really any situation that causes a person to feel anxious. Um, it could be parties or meeting new people. So staying at home, rejecting the invitations, just not wanting to go. Tests, um, anyone had the experience or know someone who tends to get sick on days where there are tests or things due um, is a pretty common example of avoiding an anxiety provoking situation. Avoiding speeches, avoiding dogs if you're afraid of dogs or avoiding needles if you're afraid of needles, um, avoiding being alone or going to new places, avoiding studying, avoiding being around sick people if you're worried about getting sick. So. Uh, this is one of the key behaviours that we see in anxiety, is this avoidance of situations. It makes a lot of sense that the person chooses to avoid those situations, but in fact we know it's actually uh, one of the things that keeps anx anxiety going is that avoidance, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. We also see uh, people using quite subtle avoidance strategies, and we call, in psychology, we call this these safety behaviours because they're things that people do to try to make themselves feel more comfortable and reduce the chances of their feared outcome actually happening. Um, so for example, for someone who was worried when speaking to others that other people wouldn't like what they have to say or think that they're dumb or boring, that person then might start speaking quite softly um, so that other people don't really hear them as well. Uh, Another example would be somebody who's very worried about not doing well on an assignment. They might decide to check that assignment over or have their parent check it over many multiple times. And it's a subtle way of trying to uh, make sure that what they're worried about doesn't actually happen. And that's something we see a lot in our clinic. Um, the frequent hand washing would be for somebody who worries about contracting germs or getting sick try to, to reduce that possibility by ha washing their hands a lot. Other anxious behaviours that we see uh, a lot in adolescence uh, and, and in childhood and adulthood also is a lot of reassurance seeking. So uh, checking, will I be okay? Is this going to be all right? Um, are you sure? Checking with mum and dad a lot um, because they're not feeling confident themselves. And just generally, we see lots of excessive attempts to achieve a sense of certainty. And this is a theme that probably runs across many anxiety disorders um, throughout the lifespan, is that when people feel anxious, often they feel a great need to be certain and to be sure that bad things aren't going to happen. And so uh, they'll try in many, many ways to try to get that certainty. And so uh, an example of that would be uh, going to a new event or a new activity and asking lots and lots of questions beforehand. Who's going to be there? What exactly is it going to involve? What's going to be expected of me? 
this can be a real sign of anxiety about, about an event. Okay. So what is... I, I mentioned before, <coughs> look, everyone has anxiety um, and, well, everyone feels anxious at times and, in fact, that's actually a good thing and we wouldn't want to eliminate all anxiety from our lives because we'd get ourselves in some very sticky situations if that were the case. Um, but at the same time, we know that people do really suffer from anxiety problems that really interfere in their lives. So what's the difference between having clinical level of anxiety and a kind of teen angst, you know, uh, a normal sort of bit of anxiety around teenage, teenage years? And of course, adolescence is a very difficult time in a lot of ways because it involves constant change. Um, there are changes, you know, biological changes, changes in the body, changes in the brain, um, social changes. Uh, we think during adolescence the way that you relate to your peers actually changes quite a lot. Uh, perhaps uh, starting to develop romantic relationships, that's a big change from, from being a child. Um, changes in the way that you relate to your family, to your siblings, to your parents, uh, changes in the way that you think about things intellectually, changes in cognitive development. So lots and lots of change going on during these years and if we think about change as being actually a bit of a stressor in people's lives, it takes effort to be able to adapt to changes, then we would expect that as people go through their teenage years, they're going to experience some anxiety and worry and that that's actually normal to experience that to a certain degree. So when does anxiety actually become what we call in psychology or in psychiatry a disorder? Um, well, you know, it's a range of different things really. It's not just one thing. Um, but basically we're talking about anxiety where there's a fear or worry about a particular event or multiple ev events and when it's excessive compared to peers or is age inappropriate. So worrying about um, being left alone at home for two hours might be quite normal when you're six to find that a scary idea. Um, but then when you're 14, perhaps that's unusual. Uh, so th that, that can um, be a sign that this is more of an anxiety problem. The fear or worry leads to avoidance of events. That's quite a key thing. So the person perhaps is not attending school as much as they should be, they're avoiding social events, family events or activities. Um, but the main thing is that the fear or worry causes significant distress or significant interference in daily activities. This is how we determine if um, anxiety is crossing the line from just kind of everyday fairly normal level of anxiety into something uh, more, more serious that might need treatment. So how common is it to have an anxiety disorder in teenage years? Uh, well, about 11% of teenagers aged between 13 and 18 meet diagnostic criteria for an anxiety disorder, so around about 1 in 10. Um, so it's not uncommon, certainly, and in fact anxiety is considerably more common um, than other disorders or other problems that you might have heard about, like depression, problems with behaviour like ADHD or oppositional defiance disorder or eating disorders. So all, um, all problems that are obviously serious and important and get a lot of attention um, but are actually much less common than anxiety problems. So what are the different anxiety disorders? I'm going to run through uh, some of those. Um, and the first one that I have on my slides is social phobia. And social phobia is essentially, really at its heart, a fear of negative evaluation by other people. So a fear that other people will think I'm boring or dumb or stupid or that, that they'll laugh at me. Um, and social anxiety, significant social anxiety, can cause people to avoid any situation where they might be evaluated. So that could range from um, situations that most people probably find a little threatening, like public speaking, um, right through to um, other social situ other performance or evaluation situations, even just answering questions.
questions in class, um, speaking to new people or going to parties uh, and any kind of social activity. And so social anxiety can actually lead to people having less friends um, and sometimes not developing their social skills as well because they don't have an opportunity to practice them. Uh, Generalised anxiety, so Mark, the, the um, case study that I showed at the beginning, that is kind of an example of social anxiety, what he talked about. Generalised anxiety disorder is, is a bit more like Laura, the case study of Laura, who worried about lots and lots of different things. Um, and often people uh, with generalised anxiety disorder will just say, look, I've always worried if something, you know, if there's a, a negative possibility out there, I'll find it to worry about. Um, and anxiety often floats across many different topics and it's often accompanied by uh, physical symptoms. So the person often um, feels keyed up or on edge or irritable, they get frequent stomach aches, headaches, muscle tension, poor concentration, those kinds of symptoms because they're worrying so much. Another kind of anxiety disorder, the probably the most common um, type of anxiety disorder is a specific phobia. And a specific phobia is a phobia or, or a really intense, almost paralyzing kind of fear of a particular event or situation or object. Um, and so examples include things like being extremely afraid of heights, storms, water, the dark, animals, injections, vomiting, uh, those kinds of things. And remember again that if it's not causing significant distress or interference, we wouldn't consider it an anxiety disorder. Um, so it might be that I'm quite afraid of snakes, but I never encounter snakes. Um, I don't avoid anything due to my fear of snakes, therefore it would not be classified as an anxiety disorder. But if it, if it meant that I stopped using my backyard in case there was a snake there, or it meant that I had to get my husband to come and check the car before I got into it in case there was a snake there, then this is what we're talking about with a phobia. Okay, uh, panic disorder um, is a disorder where the person experiences panic attacks for no apparent reason. So a panic attack is a really just an intense surge of fear or discomfort with a lot of physical symptoms of anxiety that just come very quickly, very intensely out of the blue um, and they peak within a couple of minutes and then it goes away. Um, and some people have panic attacks, they have them repetitively. Many people have one once in their life and then never have one again. And that's not, that's not a disorder. But if you're having them repeatedly and you're starting to worry when's the next one coming and perhaps starting to change your behaviour, starting to avoid situations just in case I have a panic attack there, then this is what we call panic disorder um, with agoraphobia or without agoraphobia, depending on the level of avoidance. Um, and then uh, separation anxiety disorder. And this is... Uh, um, a disorder that we most commonly see in uh, younger children, but definitely can still see in adolescents also. And this is a real fear of separation from parents or the family. Um, the person avoids being without their parents or avoids being on their own. They get very worried about physical, um, about separation and become, get physical symptoms like feeling sick at the point of separation. Um, so it's very common to see that in preschool children but it can continue right through into adolescence also and can be quite debilitating. Okay, so why, why do some people become anxious like this? Why, what causes it? Well, it's really a combination of different factors. Um, and one of the factors is genetics. So just uh, in the same way that your genes will tell you whether you're going to have blue eyes or brown eyes or be short or be tall, in the same way your genes to some degree dictate whether you can be just generally a bit of a sensitive person. Um, so there's no gene for, there's no panic disorder gene that we know of or no um, social phobia gene that we know of, um, but we, 
but the research does seem to indicate that there, e there are genes for generally being an emotionally sensitive person. And being an emotionally sensitive person has a lot of positives. Uh, emotionally sensitive people tend to be, um, of course, sensitive, uh, caring, tuned in and empathic towards other people, um, and they're often quite responsible people. Um, but it also has its downside as well, and that is uh, a tendency to be more likely to become anxious or depressed um, because of that sensitivity. So there's that genetic component. Um, also what causes anxiety, another thing that can contribute, is learning. So that can be from a direct experience. So for example, if I am bitten by a dog, I could learn that dogs are dangerous and therefore be afraid of dogs after that. Um, less concretely, if I were um, teased a lot at school or bullied a lot at school, I might learn that interacting with peers is a threatening situation and become very socially anxious. Um, so learning can take place from direct experience or it can also take place from observing other people. So we know that if we have a mother and young child and the mother is sees a spider and screams and jumps three feet in the air, that child is likely to also become scared of spiders because of course they see their parent reacting and they take away the message this is something really dangerous. Um, that's a very obvious example that I just gave there but actually it can be much more subtle than that and children are very perceptive and can pick up when their parents are not feeling comfortable with the situation and they can learn from that that oh, this situation is something that is threatening or dangerous and something that I should avoid. Um, so that's a, another contributor. The other contrib another contributor here that I've got is uh, interactions in terms of, particularly in childhood and adolescence, the development of anxiety. Um, when you have a child who's got a bit of an anxious temperament, so they are sensitive, um, they're perhaps a little bit shy, they maybe get upset more easily than the other kids. It's very normal and very natural to want to protect that child. And so what we see is this interaction where parents will step in and start uh, doing a lot of things for their kids um, to try to protect them from feeling anxious. Or they might offer their kids much more help, that anxious child, much more help than their other, their other kids who aren't so anxious. Um, or provide them with a lot of reassurance or actually allow them to avoid situations that perhaps they wouldn't allow their other kids, other children to avoid. Um, and these kinds of interactions can actually, they're um, really natural and understandable as I said, uh, makes sense, you love your child, you don't want to see them distressed and so you step in and try to protect them. Um, but one of the consequences of that is that the child starts to learn that oh, I really can't cope with things on my own. Uh, things really are too scary for me. Um, and we start to get this kind of vicious cycle where the more anxious the child becomes, the more protective the parent becomes, and then the more anxious the child becomes as a result of the overprotection. So we get a really vicious cycle, which is something that we actually address uh, in our clinic here. So what treatments are there for anxiety? Um, cognitive behaviour therapy is uh, probably the first choice of treatment um, and it's well re supported by research. So there's lots of research evidence indicating that it's a, a useful treatment, a helpful treatment. Um, and it can be used in conjunction with medications if necessary. Um, but generally with children, the recommendation would be to try a therapy that doesn't involve medication first. Um, CBT or cognitive behaviour therapy is a here and now treatment so it doesn't involve um, lying on the couch, talking about early childhood experiences um, or some of the uh, um, really delving into the past the way that you might see on TV in the movies. It's a, it's a bit more practical and I guess uh, present focused than that. And it really focuses on understanding and changing the way that a person's thoughts and behaviours contribute to their anxiety and it's skills based. So it's learning skills to change some of those patterns. Um, and parents 
in terms of treating adolescents with cognitive behaviour therapy, the parent's role in that therapy is to learn the same skills that their adolescent learned so that they can coach them at home how to, how to use the skills in the situations um, that, that are causing distress for them. So cognitive behaviour therapy addresses each of those different components of anxiety. Um, so in terms of the thoughts, uh, we know that anxious people, anxious teens, adults, children, tend to think very negatively and expect the worst to happen. And so CBT, the cognitive part of cognitive behaviour therapy, involves identifying, helping the person to know what their negative thoughts are and helping them to think realistically about what's likely to happen. So it's really important, some people think that cognitive therapy is just positive thinking. It's not just positive thinking, that's not what it's about. It's about looking at the facts and trying to come to a realistic idea or conclusion about what's likely <coughs> to happen. So there may be a situation where you feel anxious and when you look at the facts you think, oh yeah, I should be feeling anxious. This is a really dangerous situation and that's fine. There'd be no point thinking positive there. Um, what we're trying to do is be realistic. So it's a process of questioning. How likely is this feared thing to happen? Might things turn out differently to how I expect? What's the worst that could actually happen? And how would I actually cope with that? So remember Mark? <coughs> Here's some realistic thinking that he's done. So if we start with the first column, which we call event and thought. He writes down what the event is that's causing him anxiety. I want to ask Sam to go with me to Alice's party on Saturday. And his thought is, I bet he'll say no. <coughs> okay, so there we go. We can understand why he's feeling anxious there because he's anticipating a negative outcome, right? So then we check in, what is the evidence? And when I say what is the evidence, the way to, that I like to think about it is like we're in a court of law, okay? So when I go into court, um, it's not enough for me to just say, you know what, I think this guy is guilty because I've just got a general hunch about it. I've just got a feeling that he's guilty. It's not enough. I need to provide evidence. So I need to think about facts. What actually supports my opinion? So when we do realistic thinking, we think about what is the evidence? What are the facts that we know about this situation? We know that Sam is a good friend, that actually we spend a lot of time together. We know it's possible that he might say no because he has something else on, but we also know it's possible that he could say yes. Okay, these are all facts. The next step is to think about realistic consequences. So even if he said no, what would actually happen? What would be so bad about that? So we know that people with anxiety disorders tend to assume, firstly, that bad things are going to happen but also that if they do happen, it'll be absolutely terrible and they won't be able to cope with it. And so that's the level where we try to challenge a little bit. So the realistic consequences, well, if he says no, I could ask someone else. And only Sam will know that I asked him. And I'll feel bad, that's true, but it doesn't mean that I won't have fun at the party. And if he says no, that does not mean I don't like you. So what's the realistic thought? The realistic thought is, I'd, I'll never know if I don't ask. The answer will probably be yes, and even if he says no, I'll be okay. So that's an example of realistic thinking um, that's part of cognitive behaviour therapy. And it obviously takes time to learn how to do it, um, but it is extremely effective. Okay, reducing avoidance. A key part of CBT involves reducing all forms of avoidance. And the technique that's used to reduce avoidance is called exposure because it involves exposing yourself to your fear. Now, repeated exposure leads to desensitization. So what does desensitization mean? Um, so you know the way that when you get in the pool for the first time and you're kind of jumping into the pool and you feel it really, really intensely, um, it feels freezing when you first get into the ocean or into the swimming pool but over time as you kind of paddle around you don't feel it so intensely so that that's what exposure is about that you actually you jump into the pool basically and the level of intensity and distress around that goes down 
And also what happens with exposure or starting to face the things that you avoided is that you'll, you discover that your feared predictions don't necessarily come true. Often you'll try something and things will go better than you think. Um, and you may be able to cope better than you previously thought, even if things don't go exactly the way that you would like them to. So it's a really important part of treatment, um, part of CBT. And we do it slowly and gradually, so we don't actually push people into the pool, so to speak. Uh, we go in a little bit at a time. Um, and what we do with our teams is we help them to develop what we call a step ladder to enable a gradual approach to feared events. So this allows the fear to be experienced until it begins to decrease by staying in the situation. And then they just keep repeating the step again and again until they feel more comfortable with it. And then they go into something harder. Okay, so let's have a look at Mark's step ladder. So remember that Mark is really anxious about social situations, about interacting with other people. So he's gonna start by doing something fairly easy to him which is to ring Max and ask about some homework details. And then once he's done that, you know, that kind of thing a few times, he's feeling a bit more comfortable, then he's gonna start asking friends what they did at the weekend and extend the conversation by finding out more about it. Okay, so a little bit harder. Once he's feeling more comfortable with that step, then he invites Max over for dinner with the family, then walks around to Max's house to see his home asked to be included when his friends are talking about their arrangements for the weekend, arranged to meet a friend at the park to skate, bring Sam to and ask him to go to the movies, and finally go to a party. So you can see this is a person who's afraid of social situations, so we don't say to him, just go to the party from the beginning. Because what will happen if we do that is that he'll go, he'll feel really anxious and overwhelmed, he won't have a good time and he won't ever want to go back. Okay, so what we do is we start with smaller steps, build the confidence, um, allow the person to discover that actually, look, I'm not so bad with these social interactions, nothing really bad does happen, I don't get rejected, I don't get laughed at, and build up slowly and gradually towards doing more difficult things. So remember Laura. Now Laura worries a lot about her homework and she checks it excessively. And what she also does is she gets her mum to check it too. Okay. So that's a safety behaviour. She's trying to avoid not doing well on her assignment by doing this excessive check checking. So a step ladder for her would be hand in her homework without asking her mum to check it, then hand in homework without her mum checking and checking it herself only twice, then reducing that to only once, then handing it in without any checking, and then finally, as the icing on the cake, handing in some homework with a deliberate mistake in it, just to show that, you know, it's not the end of the world and she can actually cope with this situation. And then we have other coping strategies as well that are part of CBT. So learning how to surf those difficult emotions out, ride them out, uh, solve problems, assertive communication, dealing with teasing and bullying, general stress management, things like relaxation, exercise, social interaction, meditation or yoga, incorporating that, those things into the person's life, um, and also reducing unhelpful coping strategies. Um, and people will often do things to try to make themselves feel better that really are very unhelpful in the long term, like drinking alcohol, excessive alcohol, or withdraw, withdrawing from family and friends. So we reduce that. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk for another five minutes now and then I'll have some time for questions. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about is how, how can I, if you're a parent there and you have a teenager who is anxious, how can you actually help them? First thing I would say is encouraging non-anxious behavior or courage, what we call courageous behavior. So often when a teen or a child is anxious, what tends to happen is they get a lot of attention when they're anxious and when they're not feeling anxious, parent thinks, great, they're fine and they turn their attention to something else. They have other things to do, obviously, so that makes sense. Um, but we also know that when you attend to a behaviour, that behaviour actually increases. So what we actually ask our parents to do is start to pay more attention instead to the brave behaviour. So when you see your child doing something 
that is hard for them. So when you see them socialising or when you see them um, you know, going near a dog that they're afraid of, making a big fuss of that, giving that a lot of attention and when there's a lot of, when there's an anxiety going on, giving that less attention, less emotional attention. Using actual rewards can be very helpful. So in, in encouraging your child to face their fears, actually giving them a tangible reward for doing so. Some people say that's just bribing your kids. Well, maybe, but if it's in their interest, uh, we actually find you know, maybe it's not bribery, maybe it's actually a helpful strategy. Um, and rewards don't have to be monetary. They could be getting to choose what you have for dinner or they could be special time with a parent or a fun activity or watching a movie. Um, but rewarding can be super helpful there. Modeling, so uh, showing, if, if you expect your kids to be brave, then that kind of requires you to be brave as well. So um, modeling how to face fears and modeling uh, coping with your own anxiety is something that's helpful. Um, encouraging independence, really hard to do when you've got a team that seems to be really distressed. Um, naturally, you want to step in and help them and protect them. But we know in terms of building resilience and capacity to cope with things, um, that teams do <coughs> need to build more independence and that means they do need to make their own mistakes and they do need to have things go wrong so that they can learn how to, how to fix those problems and they can learn from those mistakes. And allowing them to experience natural consequences, so not jumping in to rescue from anxiety behaviour. So one example would be your child says, I don't want to go to the party, I'm too anxious to go, or they don't even say I'm too anxious, they say I've got a stomach ache and I don't want to go. Um, they are the ones who have to call a friend to say they're not coming. You don't jump in and do it for them. Actually let them experience some of the the consequences of, of what's happening. Um, reduce reassurance seeking, uh, giving reassurance to your teams. Um, so actually helping them to think logically about the situation but not jumping in and saying, yeah, it'll be okay, it'll be fine, darling, it'll be all right, we'll sort it out. Not doing that. Um, being consistent, so that means being consistent yourself but also with your, your partner or you know, with mum or dad being consistent between the two of you. Um, and keeping calm, which I know is so much easier said than done. Um, but generally, you know, when we do things, when, when, we're, when an, an adolescent is becoming extremely emotionally escalated, it's really natural that our, as a parent, emotions will also escalate and then we have this <laughs> um, very high level of intensity and it's really very difficult to make any progress out of that. So it's a parent's job, difficult as, as it is, is to try to keep their level of intensity down um, and this will help br bring the team's level of intensity down as well. And if that means walking out and just saying, look, I can't be with you right now, I'm going to go take uh, 15 minutes and just lock myself in my room and be away from you then, okay. Um, but not not building up that intensity and just generally being supportive so listening um, when your team comes to you with problems that they've had instead of trying to jump in with lots of suggestions or tell them what they could have done differently actually just listening to what they're saying and saying something like oh that sounds like it was really hard maybe that's enough you know to say that rather than jumping in and trying to fix it um, really empathising with them, showing them that you can see how they feel um, and respecting differences. You know, as teams they develop their own identity, their own preferences, their own interests, their own choices um, and just sometimes you're going to have to agree to disagree or you're going to have to um, accept that they don't think about things the way that you uh, think about them. That doesn't mean you have to give in to everything they say. You can still have boundaries and limits and so on but um, some respect there for differences will be really helpful because if there's not respect for differences, or there's not much listening or not much empathy, then what will happen is the team will think, you know what, I'm not, whenever I go to talk to mum or dad, it never turns out well, I'm just not going to do that anymore and they won't tell you anything. Um, so I, I think these are, these are key things in terms of helping. So the, at the Emotional Health Clinic, I just want to tell you about a couple of programs that we have. Um, if you're interested, one of them is called Chilled, which is the teen version of 
the Cool Kids program, which you may have heard about. Um, and basically, it's for high school students who have a primary anxiety disorder. So that means they actually have an anxiety disorder. It's significantly interfering or causing significant distress. Um, and it's the main problem. Uh, and it involves coming and doing the, thing, the things that I've just been talking about for 10 sessions with a psychologist at the Emotional Health Clinic. Um, and then we also have a program called Study Without Stress as well, which is for year 11 and 12 students who are completing the HSC. Um, and they don't need to have an anxiety disorder to participate in this program. It's for anyone who's completing an H their HSC. Um, and basically they learn cognitive behavioural skills for managing anxiety and, and stress related to HSC. And they can do that either individually with a psychologist at the clinic here, or we're going to be running next year um, groups <coughs> for this, and we're thinking about running it also in a workshop <coughs> format over like a weekend or, or something like that, or in school holidays. So actually we've got a sign-up sheet. If you're interested in <coughs> receiving information about that program, put your name down and when we're running it, we'll send you the information. And then, if, if you need more help, of course, come come to us. <laughs> that's our um, website there, and that's our phone number. Or see a school counsellor. Um, <coughs> sometimes teens are really reluctant to go and see someone, to see a counsellor or a psychologist. Um, they might be really worried about what's going to happen. And there are some good online resources out there as well. So I've put a website there, eheadspace.org.au, which has got fantastic online resources and allows the teens to um, email chat with their with the psychologist um, can be very helpful um, and then uh, the other option is to go to your GP um, who will be able to refer you to a psychologist if you don't want to come to the emotional health clinic or if you live too far away um, refer you to someone in your area and if you get a GP referral with psychologists now you can get a Medicare rebate that covers a substantial uh, portion of the fee. So that is it from me. Okay, so questions, anybody? <coughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, and look, I mean, I think that if it is still causing significant distress or interference, and, and certainly school camp's pretty important, actually, um, in a lot of ways, um, I think it would be worth having treatment for it. One thing I would think, the thing with school camp is quite complicated in a way because it involves a lot of things you could be afraid of. And I think the key will be trying to understand what the worries are under, underneath the fear of school camp. Is he worried about being separated from mum and dad? Is he worried about the social interaction at the camp? Is he worried about getting changed in front of other kids? You know, could be a whole range of things. So I think it, it, that would be the thing that I'd be wanting to do if I was, if I was treating that person, is, is try to understand what the fears are. Um, and then you could do some realistic thinking and, and step ladders around those particular fears. Yeah, so basically at the moment we <coughs> run the CHILD program in a couple of ways. We have a research program going on at the moment which is we're doing as part of a research um, study and so it is limited to those 10 sessions um, and the fee is substantially reduced because it's part of a research project. We also have at the Emotional Health Clinic though uh, psychologists who see clients uh, that it's not involved in any research. And then there's always the option of drawing, of extending the treatment, no problem. And you can, s you can go from one to the other as well. Um, and so the, the advantage of that, I guess, is it's much more flexible. I guess the question would be, I'd be wanting to know at the end of the 10 sessions, why has progress not been achieved? Is it that there's been some progress that's been achieved, but they just need more, in which case we can give more sessions? Or is it that 
there's some reason why this is not an appropriate treatment for this person, in which case there's no point just doing more of the same. We need to think of something different or refer elsewhere. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. That can be really important and definitely our psychologist will liaise with the school if that is an important part. Um, and, but we'd also encourage parents really to, to take a role in that. Um, and I think what can be helpful is if you work with the psychologist to work out a stepladder that you feel really confident with and you can actually go to the teacher and say, these are the steps we've worked out, this is what's going to be helpful for us. I think teachers are much more likely to jump on board with that than just a general, uh, where he needs to do it gradually and slowly and they don't really understand what that means or what that involves. But certainly uh, if, they w if it would be useful, then our psychologist is very happy to talk to teachers involved. Very good question. Um, so, a, a basically, a, a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, is somebody who has uh, a, either a so they have a four-year degree in psychology, and then they go on and they have a master's or a doctoral degree in clinical psychology, and then they have a year of supervised practice, and then they get called a clinical psychologist. A counselor. It is a bit more of a vague term. So some counsellors, some people who call themselves a counsellor or a therapist or a psychotherapist, these are all these kind of vague terms. Some of them may have very, very many qualifications and some may have virtually none. Um, so it doesn't tell you what study they've done. Whereas with a clinical psychologist, it, th someone is not allowed to call themselves that unless they have Th those particular qualifications. Yeah. Um, with teenagers, obviously, um, if you say a, ch a teenager's avoiding going to school mm -hmm. um, and they won't come to school and have to leave school, mm -hmm. are parents quite really physically to make them go to school, even though I guess it's illegal not to go to school? Yeah. What would be Look, that is, it's just really tough, those score refusal cases, that it's really tough. Um, it depends on the reason why they're refusing school. Again, is it social phobia essentially, or is there a real problem with teasing or bullying or some kind of victimization at the school? I think working really closely with the school is really important. I would say for parents whose teens refuse to go and see a therapist, if you're worried about your child, go yourself, because there's actually a lot that can be done um, just talking with the psychologist about ways of managing your interactions with your child that would be helpful even if your child doesn't attend the sessions themselves. Um, distance education is, is a bit of a last resort option but it's definitely one to think about if they're actually missing substantial amounts of school. That's a big worry um, and so thinking about ways that they don't lose too much in terms of their education while we're getting things sorted out um, is really important too. Um, yeah, that can be really tricky, yeah. tricky to have. Um, working with the school to get them back gradually can be really helpful. If you know that they um, are particularly anxious about on uh, sports days, for example, then starting off with going in the morning and then coming home at lunchtime before sports starts, for example, but just anything to get them started and to really minimise that pe that period of school avoidance because the longer that goes on, the more difficult it is for them to go back because A, they, you know, they're, um, they're <coughs> behind academically but also there's the social worries about how am I going to explain to everybody 
why I haven't been at school all this time. What am I going to say? Uh, so I really try to minimise that. No, with teenagers we generally work um, in the sense that we work with the teen themselves without the parent there, unless they're very anxious about being separated from their parents, in which case we can have their parent in there if they prefer. Um, and generally the way that I like to work is to get, the, depending on the age of the child, if the child's 17 and much more like an adult, maybe not so much, but particularly with the younger teens, I actually get the parents to come in for the last, say, 10 minutes of the session and have the teen explain to their parents what was discussed in session what, what they did and what the plans are for the week because cognitive beha behaviour therapy involves a lot of um, home tasks. So the exposure task this week I'm going to do my realistic thinking and I'm going to do these steps on my step ladder and the parent needs to know what those are so they can encourage them. So there's that level of involvement. And it also the CHILL program also includes a session with just the parents where the child doesn't attend. These things can always be negotiated, the level of level of involvement as well. Okay, that's like about it. All right, well thank you very much for coming this evening. I hope it's been helpful to you. Um, appreciate your attendance.